The seven heavens of Mount Celestia, where the divine spirits reside. There lived an angel named Venator. A fast-rising celestial knight, Venator was a mere diva not so long ago. But the heavenly gods quickly realized this angel was special, even among his already elite Elysian peers. Now a noble planetar, Venator was well known not only for his divine might, but also for his sage wisdom and unwavering dedication to justice at any cost, including his own self-sacrifice. Venator had rapidly become a shining beacon of the power of the stars, an astral crusader revered among his kind and the gods alike. The embodiment of physical perfection, Venator is a massive radiant guardian of the heavens, even by the lofty standards of divine protectors, standing nearly 11 feet tall with a chiseled frame and hair and feathered wings as white as the purest clouds, all mirroring his noble and untarnished spirit. He bore a gleaming blade of prismatic light named Solastar, forged with the very essence of the sun. But despite all the acclaim, accomplishments, and nobility, this star-born protector still felt he must do more. He must be more. He yearned to ascend to the revered, rare, and most elite of celestial ranks, the solar angels, the archons of justice, the most powerful of all heavenly sentinels, the angels who served directly under the gods as divine defenders of the stars their radiance illuminating the righteous realms constantly on guard and holding fast against the evils of the multiverse. Yet Venator knew such an honor was not attained by mere desire alone. To achieve such a rare honor would require proving oneself through the most difficult of divine trials. The celestial champion made his intentions clear. Venator was ready to meet this test and prove his righteous might would serve the heavens best as an elite solar angel. One fateful day, eons to a mortal, the gods summoned Venator, their voices echoing through the radiant halls of Celestia. Venator, your heart is steadfast and your spirit pure. You have shown strength of blade and character, along with the wisdom of judgment and compassion in all you do. To grant your request for ascension is no trivial task. You must undergo three epic trials that, if failed, may end your very existence. If that is a risk you are willing to accept, prove your fate among the brightest of stars and join us as one of the most esteemed agents of justice. Venator, without a second thought, accepted this challenge and was soon engaged in his first trial, one of wisdom. The planetar and would-be solar was sent to the material plane, tasked with settling a dispute that threatened to plunge a critical holy kingdom into chaos. Using his celestial insight, Venator mediated between the warring factions and in the process revealed the machinations of an infernal infiltrator. Unraveling the insidious plot and vanquishing the devil and his agents, Venator, now with the evil expelled, was able to broker a lasting peace and build a united front to stand against any future evils that may descend upon this realm. Venator had clearly demonstrated his wisdom and thus passing the first trial. The second trial was one of compassion. Venator was shown a vision of a mortal woman, desperate and on the brink of succumbing to a life in service of evil in order to protect her ailing son. It was a test of mercy and understanding that fighting evil knows no scale or limitation. From entire worlds to a single mortal, justice, mercy, and compassion, and more importantly knowing when to apply each are qualities that distinguish a solar as the epitome of a shining beacon of the heavens. Venator descended upon the mortal realm and instead of judgment offered his aid to the mother. He healed the child and counseled the mother, reminding her of the strength and kindness and the power of faith and in doing so turned her away from evil. And thus Venator passed his second trial. The third and final trial was one of strength. Venator was challenged to defeat a powerful and important Baylor who was leading a strategic battle in the Blood War. 
or the demonic forces were turning the tide in the forever war against the infernal devil forces. Unknown to many, the forces of light take great interest in this blood war. So long as the abyssal and eternal forces do not unite, the heavens and the light of law and justice will not fail. So the forces of good often take sides, doing their part in keeping this war as a stalemate. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Venator was tasked with the destruction of the massive demonic beast of the abyss. No easy task for Venator, as the Baylor named Nazravok was easily five times the angel's size. Armed with his divine sword, Venator met the Baylor in a brutal and fierce combat. The battle was intense, and yet despite the Baylor's fiery whip and destructive power, Venator's courage and strength ultimately prevailed. He vanquished the beast, proving his might, and thus passed his final trial. The gods, pleased with Venator's triumphs, summoned him back to the celestial realms. It was a grand ceremony, attended by divine beings and celestial gods from across the multiverse. Here the gods bestowed upon Venator the supreme honor of the heavens, his body now filled with divine energy, his wings radiating a dazzling, prismatic light, and his sword now burning with the sacred fire of the gods. As Venator basked in the divine light, his sense of purpose was beyond words or thoughts. He bowed before the gods, his heart brimming with gratitude and love. From this day forth, Venator will serve as a champion of the innocent, a pillar of celestial light, and a shining lighthouse in a sea of dark and evil. His ascension is not merely a personal triumph, but a testament to the virtues the gods and the heavenly realms held dear. Venator, the solar archon of justice, serving as an inspiration for angels and mortals alike. Welcome adventurers, I'm Rich and this is Riches and Liches, where it's all things Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop role-playing. Today we shed the darkness and dread of the infinitely evil side of D&D to bask in the light of justice and mercy. Together we're going to soar across the cosmos and into the celestial kingdom of the gods to discover and discuss the divine, the enigmatic solar angel. We will explore the origins of this archon of truth and justice, its creation, and the cosmic powers that guide its very being. All along with a healthy dose of the homebrew you've come to expect to make this astral projector a unique and memorable encounter at your table. So give me 10 Holy Marys, grab your prayer beads, as we ascend to the kingdom of the heavens to uncover the righteous law that is the solar angel. Sitting at the apex of this angelic hierarchy sits the solar angel, Elysian beings of divine power that serve the very hands of the gods themselves. Today we venture into the celestial realm to uncover the mysteries surrounding one of the most powerful and heavenly beings in the D&D universe, the Solar Angel. Solars are known as the most powerful celestials that exist across the multiverse, and they represent the single most powerful force of good outside of godhood itself. It is generally understood in the D&D canon that only the greatest forces of evil dare approach these bastions of justice, law, and light. Even the most powerful abyssal and infernal fiends fear the might of the celestial solar, and only demon lords and arch devils would be so confident as to tangle with a solar without the assistance of additional forces and or fiendish trickery. And because of this fact, we know that solars are not easily fooled, for their eyes see through the lies and their ears always decipher the truth. Solar angels are not born. You will not be seeing a baby cherub or cupid growing up to become a solar. They are, for lack of a better word, created. They come to be as a direct action of the gods and deities that they will serve. Solars are formed from the raw, celestial energy of the heavens and outer planes and are shaped by the will of a god or goddess into a being of immense power and unwavering loyalty. The process of angeldom, if that's even a word, is an incredibly rare event. An ascension to that of a solar from another station, such as that of a planetar as I narrated in our story open, is even more rare, occurring perhaps only a handful of times across a millennium. In fact, one might point to the rules as written in 5e and posit with some good argument that such an ascension might not even be attainable. 
I have some strong thoughts and opinions on these rules related concerns that I'll share a bit later in our homebrew section of today's video. Who does the solar serve? Solars directly serve the deity who created them and indirectly serve the mortal realm at large. Depending upon the deity's alignment and domains, a solar's duties can range from leading celestial armies against the forces of evil, to spreading healing and hope in places of despair, to carrying out divine justice. They are, for all intents and purposes, a direct extension of a god's will, although it is important to note that unlike, say, a diva angel, Solars are not mere servants. They are embodiments of their deity's principles and ideals. This gives them a level of divine authority and legitimacy that few other creatures possess. In all things, a solar serves as a celestial manifestation of its deity's will, and while steadfast in the pursuit of justice and unwavering in their loyalty to their god, they do possess free will. What is the solar's personality and intelligence? Solars are extremely intelligent, with a wisdom and knowledge that spans the cosmos. Their personalities, however, are, at least in part, defined by the deity they serve. A solar of a lawful good deity, for example, is likely to be stern, disciplined, and unwavering in their pursuit of justice, while a solar of a chaotic good deity, on the other hand, might be more spontaneous, creative, and free-spirited, better using that free will that I mentioned earlier. However, despite these differences, all solars share a deep commitment to their divine duty and a fundamental opposition to evil in all its forms. A solar will in fact slay evil without remorse. However, their wrath is not mindless or impulsive. As beings of extreme intelligence and wisdom, solars understand that hate, like any other emotion, must be tempered with reason and justice. They do not strike out in anger, but in a measured response to the transgressions that they witness. This fact should always be illustrated in terms of dialogue choice and emotion, or lack thereof, when role-playing a solar angel through interactions with a group of adventurers. Every action they take is calculated to serve the greater good and uphold the divine law of their deity. In a sense, it could be said that what solars truly hate is not any specific creature or deed, but the very concept of evil itself. The selfishness, cruelty, and greed that drives beings to harm others and upset the cosmic balance. This is what they strive against in their eternal duty, guided by the divine will of their deity. As the embodiment of law and good, a solar is almost never mistaken in its judgments. As outlined in the Monster Manual, this quality can create a sense of superiority in a solar angel, a sense that comes to the fore if an angel's tasks were to conflict with the goals of another creature. The solar also never acquiesces or gives way. They are, when it comes to the will of their god, intractable in their convictions. DMs should keep in mind when facilitating a solar in your campaign that unlike a diva or even a planetar, when a solar is sent to aid mortals, which is a rare event indeed, it is sent not to serve, but to command. For this reason, divas are usually the go-to for divine to mortal assistance, as the gods reserve solars to champion only the most dire of circumstances. What are a solar's motivations and goals? As stated, solars are divine agents of good, and they despise evil in all its forms. They hate actions and entities that spread suffering, chaos, and despair. They detest corruption and deception, and they abhor creatures and beings that defy or desecrate the natural and divine laws of the multiverse. They have a particular animus for fiends, demons, devils, and the like, who are anathema to everything the Solar stands for. In addition to the obvious hatred for evil, Solars can accommodate some level of roleplay flexibility in that they are also devoted to fulfilling the will of their deities and using the will of their god as the master of the solar in your campaign is a great way to create and present unique and surprising plots and interactions to your players that might otherwise be unavailable. A solar will often focus relentlessly with tireless devotion on a single driving purpose as decreed by its deity. Even chaotic good deities command lawful good angels, knowing that the angel's dedication to order best allows them to fulfill divine commands. 
The Solar's ultimate goal, however, is to promote the cause of their deity while combating the forces of evil wherever they may arise. However, a note to DMs, an angel is incapable of following commands that stray from the path of law and good, even if directed by its god. What is the Solar's physical description? A typical Solar well, let's be real, there is nothing typical about this angel, but they stand above nine foot tall and weigh around 500 pounds with a wingspan easily reaching twice its height. Its form is that of a well-defined humanoid of physical perfection, male or female, usually appearing as a statuesque figure that radiates a serene, calm presence and the purest of beauty. Their features are immaculate, their skin flawless, and they bear an ethereal glow that can be both comforting and intimidating. Solars have large, feathered, and powerful wings that flicker with a heavenly light, each feather seeming to be made of pure white, silver, or gold. Their eyes shine with a celestial brilliance that mirrors the very stars themselves, and each solar is meant to be unique as a singular expression of its creator's divine will. It is actually unknown where solars draw their continued powers, but most scholars believe they draw their powers directly from the positive planes and the cosmos itself, and that because of this, it is near impossible for a solar to become evil because of their connection to the higher realms. That is to say, once again, that the rules are not crystal clear here. Consider that an interpretation of my own, as fallen angels are outlined in the monster manual, but it is not clear if a solar would be included therein. And that provides a great segue as we dive into the homebrew side of things today. I want to comment only as my own opinion and my own interpretation on some of this angel's official lore in 5e. I want to state that, at least in my opinion, much of these 5e rules for the solar and even angels at large have not been fully codified, or at least the door has been certainly left open for interpretation. Point in fact, according to the official lore of the solar on page 18 of the Monster Manual, there are only 24 solars in existence. But the verbiage is kind of loose, with phrases such as, it is said that only 24 solars are known to exist. Or as I covered in the personality section, the Monster Manual states, a solar is almost never mistaken in its judgments. Like many things in the Dungeons & Dragons 5e rules, but specifically in terms of angels, which, let's face it, they've not been nearly as fleshed out and detailed over the years as their fiendish counterparts. There exists some ambiguity and gaps in the rules clarity, and I don't actually say that as a negative. As a strong homebrew advocate, I personally appreciate that Dungeons & Dragons is not a color by numbers type of game system, leaving more room for adjustment and flavor by dungeon masters and world builders. Now, those veteran players and DMs in my audience, and there are plenty, they might disagree and in fact state that 5e has become more color by numbers. And to be fair, they have a really good argument because those veterans, unlike those that have come in recent years or only from 4e as an example, possess the knowledge, the fact that over the years on balance, the various versions of the game have become simplified and perhaps even a bit watered down, certainly from the advanced Dungeons and Dragons days. But I would have to posit that this change was inevitable if the market for the game were to ever grow. I personally would love to see a move towards a more complicated 2e type of game, but I don't believe that it could ever reach the critical mass appeal that a publicly traded company like Hasbro would require. A sad but true reality. But we can at least take some solace in the fact that the OGL fiasco did not end the likes of OSR and other 2e type game systems that give us those options. And as much as I've soured on WotC with their moves of late, like the aforementioned OGL debacle, and maybe since the Hasbro acquisition all the way back in 1999, but there are still some really smart, really passionate men and women that designed 5e, and in doing so they found a far from perfect yes, but still good place of compromise, leaving something to the imagination for creative world builders, while still providing enough of a framework to play the game if you're not into such creative machinations. All this is to say that unless you are planning a campaign where a thousand solars are planned to descend upon the blood war, in which case the number of solars in the multiverse in your world might be the least of the issues that you're going to encounter, then that number of total solars in existence or any rules on how they ascend can really be left to the dungeon master and the world builder. Never forget 
players and dungeon masters alike, brand new or veteran, it's your world, it's your campaign, it's your table, and as such, this is your game. Okay, with all that said, I'm using my homebrew powers for good this week, and I have a custom angelic lair and four associated lair actions for use with your next solar angel. I'm going to try something different this week as we dive into this homebrew, and I really would like your opinion. Would you rather, as I have to this point in most other lore videos, have three or four lair ideas each episode that you can use for your own inspiration, or would you prefer a single lair with more detail and homebrew that is much closer to complete? Let me explain just a bit. I created an additional 10 lair ideas for this episode. Normally, as I outlined last week, I'll stew on them for far too long, and then I'll pick somewhere between two and four of them, depending on timing, and give you a framework, some homebrew powers, maybe some regional effects, and the lair actions, so that you can then tailor that to your level appropriate tailor, like I did with the most recent vampire episode. This week, I'm trying something different, and I've decided to take the same amount of time and create a more robust single lair from the 10 ideas and really dig into some creative details for you that I haven't provided in the past. Not only in terms of layer actions, but new stuff like unique ways to access the layer, how it might be used, potential quests or adventure hooks, etc. Listen to the remainder of this episode and then tell me which method you prefer. My patrons need not worry. I'll create all the extra homebrew stuff as always, and I'll package that up for you at month's end. By the way, you can support the channel on Patreon for as little as two bucks a month if you're so inclined. So maybe check that out. Your feedback matters. Remember, this channel is here to serve you. Maybe you'll see that in a poll coming out pretty soon. In any event, I wanted to flip our script a bit here. Normally, I design evil layers and evil actions for the players to combat almost universally. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's how it works. But angels are beings of good, so unless you have an all-evil campaign, you might ask, what good is this week's homebrew to have at your table? The obvious answer is to use these as part of your campaign arc as perhaps high-level NPCs, where this layer and the associated layer actions could be used for the players on their behalf, as they encounter perhaps a level of evil that is greater than the current party level. What a great opportunity to surprise and delight your players with an overpowered, way past deadly encounter, but then with the aid of a bulwark of justice and might, the Solar Angel, and doing so in a celestial lair. I think that would be a lot of fun. With that being said, this week's homebrew is called the Solar Citadel of Purity. The lair appears as a radiant, golden citadel floating amidst an eternal sunset, as if on a perpetual sunbeam or a halo of light where no darkness can enter. Its walls are made of a divine, metallic, silver-colored alloy that shines brighter than any earthly metal. Graceful spires reach toward the heavens, adorned with angelic sculptures and heavenly symbols. Inside, the halls are lined with ancient scrolls containing celestial wisdom. Perhaps a celestial library is present, where answers to the universe can be found if you are worthy. Now, the first question you might have, given that this citadel certainly exists on another plane or dimension, is how might the players reach such a heavenly lair? And while as the DM you are certainly able to create a mechanic using a projection or other plane traveling spell or a magic gem or a portal, those are pretty common. You don't need me for that. I have, on the other hand, created two unique artifacts and their mechanics to incorporate more interesting access into such an encounter that could be incorporated into your larger campaign arc. Celestial mounts could be a ton of fun. As part of a series of quests leading into such an epic heavenly encounter, the party could be rewarded with a riding cropped artifact type by which they could summon or befriend celestial creatures like griffins or pegasi who are capable of flying across planes. I would recommend that the quest be relatable to such a reward. Perhaps the party are asked to save a celestial creature, like a, a unicorn and his horn from an evil necromancer who seeks an unholy experiment, or perhaps is even trying to attain lichdom and create that potion. Save the beast, get free rides, pretty good, but still not super unique. This next created homebrew was the one I like best and would result in the acquisition of an artifact that I'm calling the Scepter of the Shifting Sky. This ancient artifact could be acquired in several ways, depending upon the party's level. 
Maybe the party saves a diva from certain death, or if the party is too low, an Azamar NPC. If you would prefer a stronger roleplay element and less combat, perhaps the party could assist the angel or the NPC in some form of negotiation with a kingdom, or to heal the sick. Or since divas are messengers of the gods, perhaps the diva is you know, overworked, he's way behind schedule, so he entrusts the party to deliver a message. Yes, a Dungeons and Dragons fetch quest of sorts, no doubt, but one which could create its own level of subtasks and encounters, trials and tribulations. When complete or saved, whatever the intended quest objective, the angel or NPC would, upon learning of the party's larger quest, would provide hints to this solar citadel who controls it? Where is it located? How do you get there? Again, make sure you have already dropped hints. This should not be the first time the party learns of the Citadel. They should be well in the process of seeking it. And this angel or NPC can then help them by giving them the knowledge along with a fraction of or perhaps the scepter as a whole. Your call depending upon scenario. Either way, the scepter when attuned would give some appropriate level celestial powers, light, protection from evil, advantage against evil forces, things of that nature, as well as one additional power. When the scepter's command word is learned and it is swirled into a circular motion at the proper location or range or time, all up to the DM discretion, but then it creates a celestial spectacle. A heavenly chorus erupts. A prismatic glow from the skies rains down upon the party, while a spiral of the purest white clouds descend from the heavens and form a celestial staircase leading directly to the citadel and the lair of a solar angel. Make sure all of your requirements are in place for the party's arrival before uncovering the mechanics and allowing this magic to take hold. Be sure to place proper hints all along the way leading up to this point. But this would be a great near central plot device for a chapter or even more on a longer celestial campaign. For the lair actions on this solar citadel of purity, first a regional effect. Since this is a citadel of purity, upon entering the citadel for the first time, all enchantments upon any non-angelic creature are cleansed. This would not impact items, simply any spells regardless of alignment. Of course, these spells can be recast. This actually presents quite the benefit to the player as they would presumably almost always be their first as the lair is acting on their behalf in an encounter with an evil which would ultimately invade this citadel, thus allowing the party to be buffed while the evil entities must use their turn to cast any enchantments, in effect giving the party a very strong initiative advantage. Now, as we detail the following lair actions, remember they are the solar's lair actions, so the solar would need to be present for the lair action to take effect. At my table, the lair actions would be handled by the DM who is also handling the solar angel. The first lair action is called Blessing of the Sun. The solar angel selects up to three creatures it can see within 120 feet of it. Each target regains 20 hit points and gains a plus two bonus to their AC until the angel's next turn. Number two. Heavenly Chorus The angelic music of an unseen choir fills the citadel. Each creature of the angel's choice that is within 120 feet of the angel and can hear the music must succeed on a DC 18 wisdom saving throw or be charmed until the angel's next turn. Number 3. Solar Flare The solar angel creates a solar flare that explodes in a 20 foot radius sphere of divine light at a point it can see within 120 feet. Each creature in that area must make a DC 18 dexterity saving throw or take 46 radiant damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one, as always, adjust to taste. And finally, Sunbeam Shift. As a lair action, the solar manipulates the trajectory of sunbeams that enter the citadel, causing them to enlighten a single target of the solar. The beams have one of four different effects, the choice of the solar, but no effect can be repeated two times in a row. The first is to cleanse the target, very similar to the lair action upon coming into the citadel, except in addition to removing all enchantments, it also removes curses and diseases. Number two, striking the target for 2d8 radiant damage, DC 18 constitution save for half, and acts as a turn undead on a failure. Number three, blind the creature. A DC 18 constitution save, or have the blinded condition for one round. And finally, Dawn's Renewal. The sunbeam provides a warm healing light, providing 2d8 healing 
to a given target. And that's it folks. The Solar, the ultimate hand of heavenly justice, is a unique creature that may not be a universal fit into any campaign, and as such, may need a little extra work. But the payoff is enormous, and it's guaranteed to be exciting and memorable for your table. As a preview, Venator, the very solar angel from our intro, is heading to the Nexus of Oblivion in search of some form of retribution. Look for that in a D&D Deathmatch series that should be out soon. I hope you were entertained and or learned something new today about the Dungeons & Dragons Solar Angel and had as much fun listening as I had sharing. Please consider following on Twitter at Riches and Liches, checking out our Patreon and Discord, and if you feel like I earned it, sub and ring that bell to help me grow this amazing community. Riches and Liches was created to serve you, so comment below and tell us what you'd like to see us cover next. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.